so good to see you guys. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's Labor Day weekend, all right? I just want you to kind of look at the person on your right or your left and remind them. Say, it's Labor Day weekend. Go and just tell them, man. Yeah. The reason that's crazy in, in church life normally, I probably shouldn't tell you this because next year, then you might. But anyway, normally uh, on Labor Day weekend, people just honestly decide that there's other things to do. And uh, that's kind of a week that a lot of people choose to be on vacation and I know that that, that that is obviously the case in a lot of our families' uh, uh, cases today, and that's awesome. We pray that God would protect them. But I want to just praise God because I just came from Five Forks and uh, worshiped out there at 10 o'clock. I was downtown, 845, got to hear Dick Lincoln bring the word. And I'm telling you, unbelievable worship already twice. I feel like I'm, I'm up to here. It's about to overflow. And God is working, and I'm just grateful that you guys are here today. Would you just celebrate, man, what God is doing today? Even on Labor Day weekend, man, what an awesome blessing. Next Sunday, it's not an official big day of any kind. I would just call it Welcome Back Sunday. And, and I want to encourage you, just like we've heard uh, before, to bring people. Ne- ne- we need to be people bringers. Our students say that all the time. I love that. We need to be people bringers and get people here, all right? So next Sunday's a great Sunday. Why? Because it's the Sunday after Labor Day, all right? It's kind of the, the final push where people are back from vacations and trips away. Next Sunday's a great time for you just to work uh, this, this next week into conversations uh, with people you know in your neighborhood, your family, friends at work, whatever. Opportunity to come to, to your faith family. Come and, and come to a church service. And uh, man, this fall is going to be phenomenal. And I uh, want you to uh, look ahead to that. September 29th in particular is going to be a special day. If you'll go ahead and pencil that date down, September 29th, I just told Five Forks, and I'm telling you what, Five Forks is going to show up, all right? That Sunday night, September 29th um, is, if I said 28th, it's September 29th, all right? September 29th, Sunday night is going to be something we're calling an all-in leadership preview. And all-in, very difficult for me to say that, all right, because I'm an Alabama fan, all right? But all-in, we're not saying for Clemson's sake, all right? But all-in, who won Thursday night, by the way? I'm not really sure. Anyway, yeah, some of y'all are really restraining. I'm proud of you guys, really growing. Anyway, <clears throat> all-in's hard for some of us to say, but, but as a believer, we need to go all-in, and this... October, we're going to start a really a two-year initiative, but it's going to be a five-week sermon series that really just pushes us and challenges us all to go all in for God. And September 29th is going to be a Sunday night where we just preview the vision that God has for us over the course of the next two years. And I want you to be a part of that. If you're a leader of any kind, a volunteer in preschool, if you're doing host teams, no matter what it is, or maybe you're one who just says, hey, I'd love to volunteer, I'd love to be a leader in the church, then this is for you, September 29th. I want you to go and write it down because I don't want anything to get in the way of you getting a blessing that night. September 29th, Sunday night, is a preview um, for for our All In initiative. So be ready. Go and take your Bibles. Turn in, turn on your Bibles to the Gospel of John. We've been walking through a series on the I Am Statements. And if you remember, we said this, there are seven I Am Statements of Jesus. The seven statements are kind of important because they really clarify in a lot of ways who Jesus even himself said he was. There's a lot of different opinions about who Jesus is, who Jesus is and was uh, historically. Uh, depending on if you're listening to a university professor in a public university or you listen to uh, somebody else, you're going to get various opinions based on that. Now, sometimes I've learned a long time ago that some people actually, in the name of intelligence, <laughs> uh, ignore all the factual data about it, uh, uh, the historical record of Jesus possible, because they want to do everything they can to discredit uh, faith in him. But here's what you need to understand. No matter what anybody else thinks about Jesus, we probably, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, or even if you're here today and you're just interested, let's say you're here and you're, you're seeking after God, you're kind of like, okay, I, I believe there's a God. I'm interested. I want to lean into this possibility, and I, I want to see if God reaches back out to me. You need this because here, hear what Jesus says about himself. Man, if, if you wanted to find out if you're going to believe in Jesus or believe what Jesus says to believe, You need to find out what he said about himself. And there's seven statements in the Gospel of John that clarify who Jesus even claimed to be. The first week we talked about this, it was about Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. And it was a pretty significant day because we we remember he said, 
that he is, a, he is the bread that satisfies eternally. It's not just like this temporary bread that satisfies momentarily, but it's like forever. And uh, so if we want real satisfaction, obviously, Jesus is saying you come to him, he is the bread of life. Then we talked about him being the door, or I refer to it as the sheep gate. Some translations called it the gate, the door. But here's the deal. It's, it's talking about this, this door or gate to the sheep pen. We'll talk about that even more in just a minute because today's message is kind of a part two of last Sunday as we've walked from the sheep gate or the sheep door into, he says, I am the shepherd. So he says, I am the door of the sheep or the sheep door. And then today, I am the shepherd, not just the shepherd, I am the good shepherd. Really significant word there as we talk about him being good. And so in John chapter 10, we're in John's gospel, chapter 10, let's look at verse 3 and 4 and 9 and 10 to kind of recap and remember what we read last week. Verse 3, Jesus, uh, here we go, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, speaking of the shepherd, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Then look at verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10 is that summary verse. It's kind of the one that connects uh, week 1 and week 2 of this part. And that is, he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Man, that is so important as we move forward with this idea of what it means to have an abundant life. And uh, and so we talked last week a little bit about the idea that, uh, that Jesus is declaring to be the one who can bring this abundant life. But here in particular, out of all the seven I am statements, we see two particular I am statements that appear in the same context. In other words, One is the sheep door, the other one's the shepherd, and they're actually in the same chapter. You see, the rest of them are very unique, very different. These two, in some ways, really sum up the same idea, and that's why we're kind of referring to as much as we can the first 10 verses we dealt with uh, last week. And so he says, I am the sheep door, but then he also says, I am the good shepherd again in just a moment. And so we see that we're encouraged again last Sunday to learn that Jesus desires to bring this, not just eternal life one day, but abundant life today. And if I were to define abundant life, do you remember the one word, one word that abundant life, what does it mean? Not a sneeze. Did anybody else? Anybody? Abundant life. Peace. All right. Thank you. Wasn't a rhetorical question. Uh, so if you took notes, if you ever wondered why Wayne says take notes, every now and then it might be important. Peace, all right? So what is abundant life? And what's the reason God wanted to give us this abundant life? It's peace with God, you remember? And peace from the enemy. So this peace is what everybody's searching for in this life. We want peace with God. We don't want to to be overwhelmed by the chaos and the confusion of wondering and worry and anxiety of one day when we die. Look, we don't have to worry when we die. Why? Because God has given us this peace with God. We're not worried about one day. But then also he's given us a peace from the enemy. He's going to attack us. The devil is after us. He's wanting to do everything he can to tear us down, to destroy us. Man, the thief wants to break in and steal. We see, we remember 1 Peter 5, 8 says that the enemy is uh, like a, a, a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. This is your enemy. This is what Satan is doing. He's after you like a lion. We see that God doesn't desire us to live a life of fear. He doesn't desire us to live a life of confusion. He wants you to live an abundant life now. He doesn't want you to live a life that just is enough to get by. Ultimately, the life that God wants to bring to you includes more than necessary. Now, we're not talking about just money or or food or or houses or cars. What I'm talking about is the, the substance of life. God doesn't just want you to have an okay life. He wants you to have an abundant life that's filled with a relationship with him. And that that word life in the Greek, there's two different words that ultimately uh, are are shown in the Greek there in the, in the, the day, in the language that was written in the New Testament. One is bios and the other one is uh, zoe. 
those two words are, are very different. One of them is just like biology. It's where we get biology, and it's like life of any kind, plant life or animal life, and, and it just means that, uh, that we have life. We're breathing, right? We are alive. But this other word, zoe, is a different kind of life. It's not just a life that, that means that we're functioning biologically, but it's a substantial life that gives us a connection with and a relationship with a loving God and a creator. And this is the life that God came to give us. Jesus came in order that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And so, with that in mind, we look at three things in particular this morning. Real quickly, I want you to really lean in as we walk through the rest of the text and look at what, is it, what does it mean if Jesus says that he is the good shepherd in verse 11? What does it mean that he's the good shepherd? And what does this good shepherd do? And so let's look first of all at the first thing. The good shepherd leads his sheep. It's kind of what we talked about last Sunday. He leads us. He leads us into the pen and out to the pasture. He leads us into safety and security and out to provision. And so we understand, and we heard last Sunday again, that the sheep naturally follow their good shepherd into new pasture. Uh, the sheep naturally follow their good shepherd into protection of the, the, the sheep pen. And so the sheep find true safety when they yield to the will of the shepherd. Now, put this in terms where you and me are living today in 2019. Here it is. Safety is found in surrender. Safety is really found in surrender. You see, we want to think safety is found when we go and we actually manipulate the process and we construct some kind of safety for ourselves. We, we try to build our lives in a safe way to where we're comfortable and, and we can predict and, and anticipate what's gonna happen. And so our definition of safety is very different than what God's definition of safety is because ultimately safety for a sheep, safety for a Christian is found when we surrender to the shepherd. Now here's the problem, that is not easy. That's not easy. And, uh, and we can find this. I, I know in my own personal life, there's like an example that's pretty, pretty uh, terrible because I, I have to admit something to tell you the whole story. And that is, I'm not a big pet fan, all right? I'm not. Now, I know in here, let's just do cats and dogs. How many cat people we got? Go ahead and just let me hear you. Three people. Four or five people, five cat people. Man, you guys are really ashamed. I didn't know there was so much shame in being a cat person. No, I'm kidding. How many dog people? Anybody? That is a surprise, all right? I, let me give the cat people one more chance. Any cat people? A little better, a little better. I am neither, all right? Let me just go and say it. I'm a human person. How many human people we got in the house? All right, all right. We got a few, all right? Almost as many as dogs. Anyway, here's the, here's the thing. I, Amy and I, we really prayed about it. We, we you know, from a biblical perspective, uh, the, word, the word says, be fruitful, multiply. We have five kids. The Bible never says, go get a dog or a cat. It just doesn't. I'm just trying to be obedient to, to God, you know? And, and not really, all right? If you have pets, God bless you. Now we do because we have, we're, we're in a fallen world. Anyway, so... I, I'm not a big fan of pets. For years, we didn't have pets. First 20 years of our marriage, we had some off and on. <laughs> you know what that means, right? Fish, fish float. All right, anyway, it's bad. It's a bad story. Bad things happen when pets come to our house, and it's not even intentional. I don't know what happens. We love animals. We love life. We, we do it, but I mean, I'm just telling you, we're not pet people. We're human people. So Jake really, really started um, asking for a pet. And, uh, and we, I don't know what happened. I don't know if I woke up and maybe something, I had some like epiphany or if he caught me on a weak moment. I have no idea. But he asked for an extended period of time and there was a moment of weakness when we said yes. And so Benji is our dog. Now Benji was cute. You know what I'm saying? When we got Benji... He was a pretty attractive dog. For the way dogs look, I mean, a cute little dog, you'd see him in your first reaction. I took him in, um, I took him in Alan Finley's office, the, the a veterinarian who's a deacon here, and a little plug for, for Alan. And uh, when I took him in there and, and laid Benji down, all of, the, all of the people working in the vet's office, you know what they did? Oh, 
when we'd take him anywhere in the office, oh, Benji was beautiful. Benji grew up. <laughs> Benji, I'm not saying Benji's an ugly dog. But Benji's not going to win any beauty contests anymore. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's kind of somewhere in the middle. But I'm, I'm not a massive fan of dogs. But anyway, here's for, for Benji's protection, we started recognizing we had to do something to make sure that he didn't run into the street and harm himself. We had to get a leash. For Benji, a leash is like the devil, all right? He does not like it. You put it on his neck, and he thinks you're trying to kill him. I mean, legitimately... He and, he and he has this problem. He's never bit me. That's why he's still alive. All right? I'm just telling you because I would have a big problem with that. But he does bite people. There's multiple. Don't raise your hand. There's multiple people in this room he has bitten. All right? Benji likes biting people. Usually, usually the sweeter you are. I'm not sure why, but he bites people. They're really kind people. I'm sorry. But anyway, Benji just bites. But, but, but when, you, when you put that leash on him originally, early on, he would fight it, man. He would do anything he could to avoid it. If he, if he saw the leash, he would run away from it. He didn't want anything. And then when you, when you, <laughs> when you do hook him to it, even still sometimes today, uh, it's so funny watching him. He wants to lead you. And now you're on the, he's the one on the leash, right? But he's, he's pulling. If y'all got dogs, y'all got dogs that do this too? I mean, he's pulling me, right? On the, and I'm, I'm holding the leash. But, uh, but when I want to go a different direction than, than Benji wants to go, what usually happens? This is terrible to admit. Yeah, I, I, I pull, and, and I know I, I pull softly, all right? Don't start getting upset with me. But I continue to pull, and I encourage him to come my direction. He is pulling back the whole time. Why is that? Well, number one, he doesn't appreciate the, the restriction, all right? He wants freedom. He wants liberty. He wants to be his own dog. <laughs> and do his own thing. And you may think Benji is rare, but look, we're just like that. Because here's the deal. The leash is for his own good. We moved into a new neighborhood, and I'm just telling you, I made the Facebook page first week, right? I mean, I'm, I'm already like on the list of, of people who are in trouble. But I started looking at, because of cars parked on the street and all kind of stuff, um, but, but there were um, there are people who get on there and get upset about dogs that go in their yard like literally go in their yard you know what I'm talking about and so they get on the bad list well we try to even for his own safety respect other people and do that kind of thing but also that he doesn't get harmed in the in the road so we're walking with the leash and we're protecting him it's for his own good but he didn't know that somehow Benji's so hard-headed he wants to do his own thing he wants to go his own way he wants to lead me even though he's the one in the leash and I I've just got to tell you maybe you're Maybe you're just some total, totally different category from most human beings. But I'm just telling you, most of us are like Benji with God. We think we know better. We want to go our own way. And we look at this sheep pen. We look at this shepherding idea as some restriction and boundary that we do not need. We are better than other people. We are, in our minds, above the restriction. Why would I need to be in a boundary? Why would I need to have a leash on me? God, let me free. And we pull God. We try to think we know better than God. And all the time, look, God is trying to protect us. He is trying to lead us. Because a good shepherd leads his sheep. A good shepherd leads his sheep. And ultimately, safety is going to be found in surrender. We've got to surrender to the shepherd. We've got to stop fighting him. We've got to stop pulling away from him. We've got to stop thinking our path is better than his path. We've got to start saying, God, whatever you do, I'm with you. Wherever you lead, I will follow. I'm, I'm with you. I'm not going to fight against you anymore. I want to go with you. I want to surrender to you because safety is found in surrender. And a good shepherd is going to lead his sheep. But then secondly, check this out. A good shepherd loves his sheep. The thing that draws the contrast or the distinction between Jesus and the other shepherds is that Jesus loves his sheep. See, he cares for his sheep. I, I, I can't even honestly tell you that I, I have a deep love for Benji, <laughs> but I do care for him. I don't want him to die, you know. I, I care for him, but not, not even to be compared. Not even to be compared with the fact that Jesus loves you. Man, he, he cares. He's not just leading you he loves you he's not just telling me what to do 
He's not just snapping me into shape. He's not just restricting me and giving me a list of rules so I don't get to have any fun. No, he's leading me, but he's loving me all the time. Why? Because he knows what's best for me. I mean, he knows that in my foolishness, if I'm not, if I'm not held to the leadership that he's providing, I'm going to run out in the street and I'm going to get killed. He knows that I'm going to wander off and be alone and be vulnerable to the enemy. And so because he loves me, he is leading me in the way that he's leading me. This is a picture of God's love for us. He doesn't just lead us, he loves us. Look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. Man, we're going to see in just a minute, that's a big deal. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Let's go and deal with this. Check this out. Last week I talked about the sheep pen because it says that he leads the sheep in the pen and out. He leads us in and out to pasture. So in other words, he led us in for protection, he led us out for provision. But here's what I didn't tell you last week that's so cool. When it talks about I am the, the door, I'm the sheep door, or I'm the sheep gate, that the significance of that is this pen, it's not like a chain link fence, right? This pen would have been like stack rocks, it would have been like a barrier, it would have been a wall for sure, but it was a pen, a holding place for the sheep. The sheep would be led in there at night for protection, but the gate or the door, it wasn't like a hinged door like we have today. It wouldn't even been the kind of thing we picture. I tried not to even mention that last Sunday because it might have even confused us with the understanding that Jesus was trying to show us. But here's the deal. When he says he is, he is the shepherd and he lays down his life for a sheep, in, in one sense, we have to understand he's talking about the cross. All right, so it's saying Jesus has come as our good shepherd. He has given his life for us. He died for us. You can't, you can't lay down your life any more than that. Jesus literally gave everything. He died for our sins. But in this context of shepherd, when the sheep would go in the door, in the opening, this wall would have stopped and there would have been an opening. And there wouldn't have been a wooden door or an iron gate. It would have been an opening. And, and to prevent thieves coming in and stealing the sheep to prevent wild animals like wolves from coming in and, and, and killing the sheep, the shepherd would literally lay down at the opening. <laughs> this is so good, man, I'm telling you. He, he, he laid down at the opening and he became a human door, preventing anything from coming in to harm the sheep. That is so crazy cool. That when Jesus is talking to us, he's telling us, hey, I'm not just... Uh, the, the gate, hey, I, I'm the door, but I'm also the shepherd, and I lay down my life. I'm, I'm here to protect you. Look, Jesus is saying, I'm not your enemy. I'm not just pulling you back from good stuff. Man, I'm protecting you from foolishness. You know what he does for me? He protects me from myself. He protects us from mistakes we would make. Amen. He's laying down and protecting us from the wolves that would come in, that would rush in and steal and kill and then when even he, he does the good shepherd why would it specifically say he's the good shepherd uh, from a, a contextual perspective shepherds weren't like the top of the 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 totem pole all right uh, shepherds would have been uh, a very uh, a, a people that would have been looked down on all right shepherds would have been uh, people that wouldn't have been necessarily trusted uh, they would have been people who perhaps been outcast. Uh, they would have been, they couldn't do anything but watch these sheep. You remember even in the Old Testament uh, when the brothers of David, I'm talking about David, oh, he's watching those few sheep. It's a degrading contextual reference. They're just kind of saying, ah, oh, he's, he's just a shepherd. And so in that way, we understand these were not trusted people as much as we would think a shepherd. When we think of a shepherd, you remember the Sunday school posters of a shepherd? They were always so sweet, you know? You know, really kind and trustworthy. And that just obviously helps us in our North American context to understand maybe what a shepherd looks like. But in this understanding what, what Jesus is trying to say, in contrast to other shepherds who can't be trusted, in contrast to other shepherds who are in it for the money, in contrast to shepherds who are hirelings, and they're just doing it because they've got a motive to make money. I'm a good shepherd. I, I, am, I am your good shepherd. And I'm here to lay down my life for you. Why? Because I'm not just going to lead you. I'm going to love you. I'm not just going to tell you what to do and what not to do. 
I want to care for you. I want to hold you when you're hurting. I, I want to I intercede with a father on your behalf when, when you're in pain. I want to build a bridge to the Father for you in salvation. I, I love you. See, he didn't just lead us. He loves us. That is massive. But that leads us to the third thing. The good shepherd wants to know you. He doesn't just lead us. He doesn't just love us. But he also knows us. This is so important. In the midst of all of, uh, all of the universe. Think about billions of people on this planet. Billions of people on this planet. God knows you. He knows you. Now here's the deal. You may be in here today. You may have walked in. Maybe you got a friend who's connected to the church and you're checking it out. Maybe you're watching at home today and you say, well, you know, I, I know about God. And when I hear people say, do you know God? Maybe, maybe I know God. Maybe, that's, or is, maybe you're saying, maybe I know God. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. It's important that we, we know what we mean by know. <laughs> because when it says in verse 14, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. So this is like he's, he's saying that we actually have the opportunity in a minute it's going to, to know him the way that he knows the Father. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep and, and I have other sheep that are not in this fold. Speaking of the Gentiles, not just the Jews. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and there will be one shepherd. So Jesus knows you. The question is, do you know Jesus? I, I, know, I know that we know God knows us, that God knows. In fact, the scripture tells us that he knows how many hairs are on our head. My dad used to say, I know you know my dad was a pastor for all his years, and my dad used to say, you know, that he's counted the number of hairs on all of our head. Some of us, it didn't take very long to count. Amen? And that's true. The older we get, you know, that's kind of true. But, but the, the fact is that he intimately knows you. He knows every thing about you see God knows you but do you know God do you know Jesus do you have a relationship with Jesus let me show you the difference if you were to say Wayne do you know Freddie Freeman I mean literally if you asked me that question hey you know Freddie Freeman I'd be like absolutely what do you think I'm what do you think I'm a communist I'm sorry I shouldn't have said it that way probably but I'm a Braves fan right so Freddie Freeman is the first baseman for the Atlanta Braves um, by the way, if we had any communists in the room today, I apologize. Amen, all right? Yeah, but y'all all right? Y'all can laugh, all right? It's okay, all right? It's okay. I'm the one getting the letters, not you. We're okay, all right? Anyway, so, so do you know Freddie Freeman? I totally know Freddie Freeman. Man, he's batting 300. He's going to hit 40 home runs. What? It's crazy, man. I know Freddie Freeman. I totally know Freddie Freeman. Have you ever met Freddie Freeman? Well, no. Never met him. Have you ever talked to him on the phone? No, nope, nope, never talked to him, never had a verbal conversation with a guy, although I do think we're connected somehow. It's really cool. You know, I could probably play as good if they needed me to come out there. But anyway, Freddie is, is phenomenal. I, I know about him, but I don't know him. And here's the sad thing. I mean, if you really just ask yourself this question, I mean, do you know Jesus? Yeah, man. He's born in Bethlehem. <laughs> I know his birthday. <laughs> Right? His mom? Mary. Sure. Totally. I know this guy, Jesus. I got it. I, I know about him. I could tell you. Man, do you, have you ever, you know, talked to him? You ever met him? I'm not telling me do you know about him. I'm talking about do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? I mean, are you talking to him on a regular basis? Because here's the deal. If you're not, then that's why you don't really embrace his leadership and you don't acknowledge his love. Is because you don't know him. And maybe when he speaks, you don't even hear his voice because you haven't been his sheep. I mean, you've just kind of been running away from that. The best example that I could even consider was it's like a marriage relationship. I mean, me and Amy, I mean, honestly, God's gift to me. Man, the, the second best event of my life the first was Jesus, for sure, but second best is the day that Amy came into my life. And she said, I do. I mean, wow, what? 
That's crazy. And I, I, I'm just amazing. But understand this, there's still obviously, it's not a perfect, perfect relationship. There's times where uh, she has to continually correct me and get me, <laughs> snap me into shape. Constant. I'm a work in progress. And so understanding that covenant relationship, what has kept you together for 23 years? What's the secret, you know? And hopefully when I'm, you know, we've been together 75 years, what's the secret, Wayne? You know what our secret will be? It won't be, well, you know, I've just learned, I've just had to learn the hard way that, you know, it's just it's about wisdom. It's about, so, no, you know what it's about? It's about a covenant. Amen. It's about the fact that we made a covenant before God to love one another until death. That's, it's, it doesn't make it easy. It doesn't make doesn't make everything high fives every day, you know, 365 days a year. It's not the honeymoon every day. But here's the deal. She loves me. She loves me. And her love for me and my love for her, it's what keeps us devoted to one another, surrendered to one another. And in the same way, our love for God, our acknowledgement that he loves us. And see, we know him. We know him. And we know that we can be uh, uh, vulnerable in front of him. So I can say things in front of Amy that I couldn't say in front of anybody else. I can trust, I can trust her with my life. Why? Because I know her better than I know anybody else. And see, when I know God and I, I know his intentions are good for me, and I know he's leading me in a way because he loves me in a way no one else could, Man, it makes me want to know him more. So here's the deal. You'll never fully know God purely from an intellectual pursuit. And if you're intellectually pursuing to know God enough to be saved, I'm going to save you some time. You can quit. Because you're never going to know God enough intellectually to have eternal life with him. You're never going to know God enough intellectually. You're never going to gather enough factual information about Jesus to satisfy your mind enough to live an abundant life. You can't earn it. I mean, there's no way you can like learn enough to live abundantly on your own. See, it's one of those things where we've got to know him. And when we know him, we live an abundant life from the knowledge of knowing him and knowing that he leads us and he loves us. And so today, here's the invitation. It's so easy, honestly. It's simple. The fact of the matter is he's done everything in the world for us. He, has, he is the perfect good shepherd. We don't have to wonder what his motivations are. We don't have to wonder if he's in it for the money. We don't have to wonder if Jesus is in it so that, so that you know, he, he has some ulterior motive. Man, he, he wants to lead you. He wants to love you. He wants to know you. The question is, you know, what are we waiting for? Why aren't we diving into this relationship with Jesus? You may say, well, what's the first step to that? I mean, every Sunday we, we end with a, co a commitment song. It's an opportunity for you to respond. Some of us just come down and pray. I mean, I don't know if you ever noticed. Some people just rush kind of to the altar and they pray with friends and family. And they just, they thank God sometimes for what He's done, maybe they heard something in the word that reminded them of why they love God so much, and they just come and pray. Maybe they've got a burden they want to lay down, you know, and they bring somebody to pray with them about that. But then other people come and respond, and they say, hey, I want to make a decision. I, I want to follow God. I I'm not sure what that means. I, I, want, to, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be a Christian. Um, and, and, and there are ministers down here who can talk to you about that today. You don't have to wait till one day. You can, you can start that abundant life today. The other option is that card, the worship guide that Pat mentioned earlier. You should have got it when you came in. You can get a pen, just write your name, contact information. Take that to that kiosk across the way, the information kiosk. And we'd love to connect with you this week, talk to you, have a conversation about that relationship. And that's the most important thing. Here's the deal. He's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He, he knows you already. He wants you to know him. I want to pray for you that God would move you to action. That he wouldn't just move you internally, but that he would move you to action. That you would respond to his love for you. Let me pray for you. God, we love you. You are so good to us. And we could never possibly be good enough.
to deserve your love, but Lord, we're thankful that you didn't, you didn't make us be good enough. Lord, that you, you love us. And I pray today that you would help us even recognize and acknowledge how much you love us, that you don't just lead us out of some authoritarian dictatorship, God, but you, you lead us because you love us. You got in mind what's best for us and you're trying to protect us from so many things we foolishly chase. So Lord, today I pray you would help us see your love. That you'd help us see how much you want to know us and us to know you, God. Help us make the decisions we need to make and surrender to you today. In Jesus' name.